Thank you, Eva, for that. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. God is good. And all the time. Amen. All right, let's see if we can get all this together. I know it goes here somewhere. There we go. That goes there. That goes there. Does this have to go in there too? We're good. All right. Oh, there we go. Technology. You never know. Always have a backup plan. All right. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we humble ourselves before you right now. We are so thankful for your mercy and your grace. We are thankful, Father, for life itself that you give us each and every day. You have provided for our needs. You've watched over us. Some of us, Father, have difficult emotional things going on in our lives that we need your help with. Some of us, Father, have financial struggles that we need your help with. Some of us, Father, have addiction struggles that we need your help with. But Lord, we realize that we've all fallen short <clears throat> and we need you. And as we come before you today, I just pray that you would open our hearts and minds to the message in Jesus' name. Amen. Destroying the gospel. Did you know that we can easily destroy what God has done by our actions? So today, we're going to look at a few things. We're going to start with Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, so grace through faith, where's the works? Are there works there? No. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And so today we're going to look at the story of Naaman and try and understand a little bit about that, of how it could be a blessing to us and help us to walk our daily walk. So Naaman in the gospel. Now, 2 Kings chapter 5, if you'd like to turn there. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Right? So he had something that back then wasn't curable, that had you separate from your loved ones, isolate yourselves, and eventually led to a very disabling life. Chapter 5, verse 2. Now the bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. So here's a young lady who had been taken away from her parents. Imagine that. How many of us parents would be Sorely distressed if somebody came and took away one of our children. And she said to her, mit her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria. So here's a young lady who'd been taken away from her parents. Who felt compassion for those that she was forced to work for. And she saw her mistress's husband that he had leprosy. And she had been brought up by her parents to believe in the one true God. And she knew that there was a prophet in Israel who was so connected to the Lord that he could help her husband, Naaman. And she tells her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. 
Who does that prophet represent in this story? Doesn't he represent Jesus? That we are to send those who are struggling with their issues, whatever they are, to Jesus to be healed? Now Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. Now think about what she had said. She said there's a prophet in Israel, she told her mistress, and that if your husband was to go there, I believe that that prophet could heal him. So Naaman goes to his master and told him what the girl from Israel said. So Naaman must have had a trust in this young lady, which means that she was probably very diligent, even though she was a slave, she must have been very diligent and kind-hearted and merciful to those that she was serving. So even in the face of adversity, how are we to act to those who mistreat us? We could take a lesson from her. And so the king says, by all means, go. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. Now, what had she told her mistress? And her mistress had told her husband, go see the prophet. Now, somewhere in the translation from Naaman's wife to Naaman to the king, it got translated into, I will go to the king of Israel to talk to him about being healed. Where was he supposed to go? To the prophet. Do you see how things can change over time if we're not, sh if we're not careful in how we convey the message? Right? And so the king says, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. Now that's a lot of money, isn't it? Six thousand shekels of gold and ten talents of silver. I didn't take the time to translate that in today's dollars, but my guess is it's tens of thousands of dollars, right? But let us remember that we cannot buy salvation. It is a free gift. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Who cures us of our sin problem? Jesus cures us of our sin problem. In verse 7, as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does his fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. Now, he's the king of Israel. If this little girl knew there was a prophet, why is the king acting like this? Doesn't he know there's a prophet in Israel? Doesn't he have faith? Hasn't he heard the stories of what that prophet has done? Why was his reaction like this? Think about it. Continuing, Elisha when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. When we know someone who's struggling with an addiction, who's struggling with anything, where are we to send them? We are to lead them to the Savior's hand and help them understand that God is able to help them. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Who are the messengers of God on this earth right now besides the angels? Besides angels. It is we. We are. And God wants us to go and tell those who are hurting that there is a God in heaven that if they're willing to confess their sin and seek him, 
he will help them. And Elisha sent him a messenger. Those messengers are us. God is asking us to go and touch someone. All of us know someone who is hurting. It may be a family member. It may be a spouse. It may be a neighbor. It may be the cashier of the store we're in. But we have a word for them. The story continues, but Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Now, what was Naaman struggling with? Do any of us struggle with pride? His way. His expectation of how God was going to work. Do we have expectations of how God should work in somebody's life? Are we willing to be patient with how he is working? Naaman was struggling with a pride. Look at what he says. Are not Albana and Phifar, Par, the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Do we think our way is better than God's? Isn't God's word enough for us to know how to live? Are we willing to trust it? Or are we too proud to yield to God and allow him to lead and guide us as little children. Because he's told us in the New Testament, we are to be like little children. And he's asking us to follow him and trust him and to trust his word. He's asking us to trust his word. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Is there somebody we know that's struggling that we can give a word of encouragement to? That we could give our personal testimony to, to help them to know what God has done in our life? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. You know, I was reading in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, and she writes, The faith of Naaman was being tested while pride, while pride struggled for the mastery But faith conquered, and the haughty Syrian yielded his pride of heart and bowed in submission to the revealed will of Jehovah. Do you know anybody that's struggling with pride? That doesn't want to listen to the word of God? Is that person in the bathroom mirror when you go to the bathroom? Is it a friend? Is it a coworker? Is it a relative? Don't we all struggle with a form of pride? God wants us to be humble so that he can work with us. And we see that when Naaman was willing to humble himself and just follow the word, the simple word of God, how hard was it to go and wash seven times? And he was cured. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept the gift from your servant. So what happened to Naaman here? He had an experience because he saw the power of God work in his life. And it changed his heart. 
He had humbled himself and he had been healed. And now in his culture, it was common to go and give a large gift for somebody to heal you. And so he says, now I know there's no other God in all the world except Israel, so please accept this gift from your servant. So he wanted to give all that gold and all that silver and all those clothes. But you know, there's another character here that this passage is all about. Naaman had a struggle with pride. But now we're going to look at another character who was struggling. And the prophet said no, not because God didn't want his money, but because there was another soul to be worked on. The prophet, ans the prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept the thing. Even though Naaman urged him, he refused. So he refused for a specific reason, because there was somebody else's heart in this story we haven't met yet that was struggling with worldly desires And the story goes on. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. So Naaman had that full conversion experience. He was now a servant of the Most High. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimmon, to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. And Elisha said, go in peace. You know, there are times, I just want to caution us, that when we're studying with somebody, the Lord may be working on something in their life that he hasn't informed us yet. And we need to be very careful of picking at the visual things that we think need, they need to change when God is still working on the heart. You know, Sister White talks about that when we pick on those things that are visual, sometimes it's just like cutting leaves off a tree, but we're not getting to the root of the issue. And she counsels us that those things that we think they should change will change when they have that abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. And so our focus should be to help them to learn to love and surrender to him. And so Elisha tells him, basically, don't worry about it. God understands. You're okay. He knows your heart. And after Naaman had traveled some distance, now our character other character comes into play. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, so who is Gehazi? He's been with Elisha for some time, from what we can tell. He's a servant of Elisha. He's seen what Elisha has been doing. But Gehazi, he has a struggle. He's struggling with something. And he said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. Now, Naaman had been told that he didn't have to do anything else for his salvation. And he had a beautiful story to bring back to his kingdom to share that I went there with all of this stuff to buy my healing and the God of Israel, the one true God, didn't need any of that to heal me. He just said, do this one simple thing and you will be healed. And so he was on his way back with this story of what God had done. But Gehazi is going to mess it all up. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say. Had his master sent him? 
Careful how you answer that. That's a trick question. Who was he serving? He wasn't serving Elisha. He was serving the former light bearer in heaven, now named Satan. Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. Gehazi is struggling with worldly desires. He wants to have that wealth. He's tired of living in poverty with the prophet. But you know, God puts us in specific situations to learn something and to try our characters and to see if we're willing to trust him with our needs. And Gehazi wasn't willing. He was willing to give up eternity for a few dollars. When he went in, oops, I'm back, sorry. And the two young, so everything all right? Gehazi answered, my master said to me, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to, from a hill country in Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. So Naaman does give him two talents of silver and the clothing he asked for and send some servants on his way to help him. But Gehazi feels a little guilty when he starts getting close back to where he's living with the prophet. So he sends the, the helpers on their way. And as in other stories, he goes and he hides what he has taken. And then he goes in to see his master. And when he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant did not go anywhere, Gehazi answered. You know, this story reminds me of a couple of stories in the Bible. There's a New Testament story of Ananias and Sapphira who made a promise to give some funds to the growing church. But they kind of lusted after the pride of being seen as giving something while wanting to hold back that which they had sold. And they went in and they were willing to lie. In their particular instance, the result was instant death. But Gehazi was going to learn a longer lesson. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Now, I don't know about you, but I think at this point, Gehazi should have fallen on his knees begging forgiveness and crying out, please forgive me, I have sinned. But I don't see that in this story. Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves or vineyards or flocks and herds or male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now, there is an important lesson for us in this story. For those of you that are studiers of Daniel and Revelation, and if you haven't studied that, I'm going to urge you to speak to one of the elders or myself to get an understanding from the Word of God who knows all things what is about to happen on this earth. Because all of us that are alive in the short future are going to be asked this question. Is this time to take money or accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds, translated into modern ways? Is it time to keep your job and worship on a different day than the Scriptures say? Is it time to capitulate or do we stand fast to what's 
the Word of God says. There are those out there that are trying to rewrite what the Spirit of Prophecy says and what the Word of God clearly says. And we will be tested. And in knowing this Word and trusting in God is our only safety. We need, <clears throat> excuse me, we need His Spirit to understand. And it's important when we go to study that we open this word with prayer and understanding. I was listening to a message. I'll give you a brief interlude in this. I was listening to a message the other day, and the pastor was talking about the importance of doing good hermeneutics. That's, in other words, how to study the Bible accurately and properly. And there are those that if you go to, I think it's Colossians chapter 5, where it talks about don't judge others on their food and their drink and their Sabbaths. And he goes, you know, if we don't understand the context of what the author was trying to say to the people in that time, we might misunderstand what the author is trying to say to us. And the example he gave was, for those of us that have been in the church for a while, who knows what a haystack is, right? It's not a pile of hay, folks, for those of us that are visiting. It's equivalent to a taco salad, right? But he said, you know, if, if some time in the future, some archivist had found an email from a past, a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, it said, this afternoon after service, we're going to have haystacks for lunch. He might have thought of Daniel, where the king of Babylon was sent out into the wild and was chewing on grass for seven years. And he might translate that, that email into... They had bales of hay that they had for lunch. If they didn't know the context of what that message was and what it was at the time and how it would apply to us today. And so when we study the Bible, it's important to know who it was written to at that time so we can understand how it applies to us today. And so we will continue on. 1 John 2.16 says, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and our pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. This is what Gehazi is struggling with, and this is what a lot of us are struggling with, and we need to just admit it. We're struggling with these things, and if we're willing to admit it, then God can help us. 2 Kings 5, 26 and 27. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit... Well, I'm not sure why I have this again. Let me uh, continue on. So, what is the problem? A brief synopsis. Romans 3, 23. For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. I hope you agree with that. Because that's what the Word of God says. Romans 3, 10 says, As the Scriptures say, No one is righteous, not even one. The only one that was ever righteous on this planet for his whole life was by the name of Jesus Christ. What are the consequences for our sins? When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone like a disease, and everyone sinned. Romans 5.12. Romans 6.23. For when people sin, they earn what sin pays. Do you know there's a, there's a payment for sin? We earn our wages, the Bible says, and those wages are death. But God gives his people a free gift, eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Have you accepted that gift? Romans 1.20 says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky, though everything God has made, through everything God has made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Even the staunch, staunchest atheist has access to the influence of angels, of the Holy Spirit, and of what God has made. And God is saying, 
that everyone, wherever they are, can see that there is a creator who created all things. And we have no excuse to believe otherwise. The solution, Romans 5, 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, while we hated him, while we were angry at him. My boss was sharing a testimony this week of somebody who'd written in to work and she was very, very, very angry and expressed it. And I'll tell you, I received an angry phone call this week from somebody who got this little book in the mail. Now, most of us get so all sorts of mail that we don't ask for. She called up and she said, I want to be taken off your mailing list. This is just this week. I get these every once in a while. And I said, what did you get? And she said, I got this little book in the mail. I said, well, who was it addressed to? She goes, resident. And I said, well, I said, the best I think I can do is I can give you the address that the post office gives us that you can, you can write them or you can go to their website and, and uh, sign up. And she got very angry and she started yelling and screaming. And I've tried that. And, and then I won't get into the rest of what she said, but it was rather loud. So I hung up because it was obnoxious. But people are, people are affected by just a piece of literature in the mail. Now, I don't know about you, but if I got that upset over every time I got an offer for windows to be fixed and roofing to be done and all that stuff, I'd be in pretty bad shape. But what that tells me then is that somebody that represented Jesus Christ probably misrepresented Jesus Christ to them. Gehazi misrepresented the gospel to Naaman. Naaman's story was going to be so beautiful when he went back. I went there to be healed with all this, and they wanted nothing in return. Just a thanks. Isn't that what the gospel is about? God just wants our praise, our thanks. Romans 10 9 and 10 says, we're almost done. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Isn't that what the thief on the cross did? For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That's how simple the gospel is. All the other things will work out as we allow Jesus to work in our lives. For some people, their life will change dramatically overnight. For others, it's a slow progression. But they're still changing because they trust the Lord. The assurance, Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will be kept in perfect peace, peace, all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. You know, we have a lot of distractions today. So many distractions. Not going to go into them. We've talked about them before. Dr. Walsh is covering them. I don't think we need to go over them. But I'll tell you, there's a thousand and one ways to be distracted. But God is telling us if we want peace in our lives to keep our thoughts fixed on him. And so I'm going to ask you all to analyze what you do each and every day. And to ask yourself this question, are my thoughts focused on Jesus Christ and what he has done for me? Am I comfortable with what he's done for me? Or am I letting myself be distracted into other things? 
Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate, and I threw in parentheses in capital letters, you can say it, separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing except your choice can separate you from the love of God. So a closing thought is I want to challenge us all. If you haven't given your heart to Jesus Christ today, right now is the day to do it. Not tomorrow, not next week, but today. And we have a supply of these little books. For those of you that know which book this is, it's the company I work for prints these, but it's really, it's just path, it's steps to Christ relabeled as path to peace. And so many people need peace in their lives. And this little book is something I cherish. I, I just love reading it. It's, it's got so many good things in there. But if you haven't given yourself to Jesus, I want to offer you this book today. Please see me after service. We'll get you one. There's no cost. There's no obligation. But today, if you haven't ever given yourself to Jesus Christ, today's the day. If you're struggling with something in your life, the power of the word will give you victory. See one of the elders or the deacons or deaconesses, and we will pray for you. And I promise you that God will do mighty things in your life. Jesus was able to raise the dead, heal the lepers, open the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, and the mouth of the mute. He can help you too. So his call today is to just trust him and call on him. And he will help you. Are you sure this morning of what your rock is? We have elders and deacons and deaconesses that would be willing to pray with you and to help you and to study with you, to help you to get to know the God who loves you more than himself. Shall we bow our heads? Father in heaven, Lord, I know there's someone here struggling. We ask for you to touch their hearts, to encourage them, Father, and to help them sense that there is hope in Jesus Christ, that you will help them, that you love them more than you love yourself. You are a completely selfless God. Oh, Father, help them to grow in faith and trust in you and help them to sense your abiding peace and power and to know that there are people here who care and that we are willing to help them, to get them into a class, to help them, to pray for them, to encourage them, to be an accountability partner, whatever it takes, or to get them counseling if that's what it takes. Whatever it takes, Father, we're willing to help them. Father, be with us, be with them, and forgive us our sins, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.